Welcome to the panel sponsored by ASIL's Cultural Heritage and the Arts Interest Group. My name is Allison Dundies Rentelm. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Southern California and vice chair of this interest group. My research focuses on cultural rights, and I've uh, done a book with my colleagues, James Nafziger and Robert Patterson, Cultural Law, that exemplifies the types of conversations, interdisciplinary conversations that we're going to have during our session. Our panel is entitled Interdisciplinary Approaches to Cultural Heritage and the Arts, and we'll be focusing on the contributions of scholars from diverse fields of knowledge in various countries. While the speakers are going to share their insights about cultural heritage law, they'll also address the question of how we can better open up our field to include new voices and new kinds of art, new forms of art. We want to move away from having elite control of our definitions and understandings of culture and the arts. We want to include folklore, visual anthropology, photography, new areas of digital humanities, and so on. And international law specialists, whether academics or practitioners, will benefit from exposure to these disciplines. Without further ado, allow me to introduce our distinguished speakers. They are among the most imaginative scholars in the field of cultural heritage. We have Professor Valdemar Hofstein, Professor of Folklore at the University of Iceland. And the title of his talk is Distinguishing Cultural Property and Cultural Heritage, Technologies of Sovereignty and Reformation. Valdemar is former president of the International Society for Ethnology and Folklore and former chair of the Icelandic Commission for UNESCO. A prolific scholar, he has three books on cultural heritage, Patrimonialities, Making Int Intangible Heritage, and Cultural Heritage in Iceland. And he has a wonderful documentary film, The Flight of the Condor, that's been shown at many film festivals and is available in open access. Our second speaker is Dr. Jonathan Liljeblad, a senior lecturer at the Australian National University College of Law. The title of his talk is Interdisciplinary, Cross-Practice, Cross-Issue, Reflections on Field Studies of Heritage Struggles in Myanmar. Dr. Lidjelblad has a JD and PhD from USC and a bachelor's degree from Caltech. His research focuses on promoting international norms in developing countries and the challenges associated with that. And he's written on human rights, cultural heritage and environmental conservation. Since 2004, his fieldwork has focused on Myanmar where he's been a consultant for a number of aid organizations including the International Commission of Jurists, the Danish Institute of Human Rights, and various domestic Myanmar civil society groups. He was born in Myanmar and grew up in Sweden. He is a member of the Pa'o indigenous peoples of Shan State, Myanmar. Our third speaker is Dr. Kristen Hausler. She is senior Dorset fellow and director of the Center for International Law at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. The title of her talk is, Is More Than an Interdisciplinary Approach to Cultural Heritage Protection? needed. She is an international lawyer with expertise in cultural heritage. She's currently teaching a course on cultural policy at the University of Florida, and she conducts training on cultural heritage protection for armed groups and police officers. In the past, she worked at the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver and worked on a project concerning the return of ancestral remains to indigenous communities. Our fourth speaker is Professor James Nafziger. He is the Tom B. Stoll Professor of Law and Director of International Law Programs at Willamette University College of Law. The title of his remarks, Territorial Barriers on the Border of International Law II. Professor Nafziger is the author or editor of many, many books and articles in the field of cultural law. He is currently the Secretary of the American Society of International Law and Vice Chair of the Committee on Cultural Heritage Law. Professor Nafziger is one of the foremost authorities in the field of public international law and is world renowned for his scholarship in cultural heritage, sports law, and many other areas of law. We're very fortunate to have such a distinguished panel. Let, let us begin with our first speaker, Professor Valdemar Hofstein. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be with you and to take part in this panel. Uh, I'm going to sketch the outlines of an argument that I've developed with a Danish colleague, Martin Skrustrup, wonderful name, building on our respective ethnographic research in the fields of cultural property and cultural heritage. 
It was published as a book in November with a cover pictured here. So let me open it up and, and dive right in. In 2007, Scotland's first minister, Alex Salmond, deplored the fact, unacceptable in his view, that the Lewis chessmen are still, quote, scattered around. And you can be assured, Salmond declared, that I will continue campaigning for a united set of Lewis chessmen in an independent Scotland. Now, Salmon's demand for the return of cultural property is inseparable from his claim to national sovereignty. The former is a technology to produce the latter, a united set of chessmen in an independent Scotland. Salmon's assurance in 2007 reaffirmed a claim he staked a decade earlier when he argued in an interview with the Sunday Times that, quote, just as the Elgin marbles should be restored to Greece, so should ancient artifacts come home to Scotland. There's no justification for them to remain in England. And speaking of the Elgin marbles, or rather the Parthenon sculptures, the first formal claim for the return of these sculptures, friezes, and other monuments that Lord Elgin removed from the Acropolis and shipped to London was filed through official diplomatic protocols as late as 1983, following a celebrated speech at, at a UNESCO summit by Melina Mercuri. Minister of Culture of Greece. During her two terms as Minister of Culture, Mercuri campaigned for the return of the sculptures with impassioned pleas that referred ultimately to the emancipation, the unity, and the sovereignty of Greece. And I quote her, because they are the symbol and the blood and the soul of the Greek people, because we have fought and died for the Parthenon and the Acropolis, because when we are born, they talk to us about all this great history that makes Greekness. Because the Parthenon was torn down and mutilated when we were under Ottoman Turkish occupation. Because the marbles were taken by an aristocrat like Lord Elgin for his pleasure. Because this is our cultural history and it belongs not to the British Museum, but to this country and this temple. The marbles have been in England for 180 years. Enough. It's time for them to come home. Now, we would be hard pressed to come up with a demonstration that is finer or more eloquent of cultural property as a technology of sovereignty, of cultural property as claims that help to produce sovereign subjects in the mold of the liberal modern state, nations with rights, territories, borders, and property. We developed the Parthenon case in our book along with that of the Lewis Chessman, but for today's purpose, it suffices to say that in various fora, cultural property claims forge unexpected alliances. Thus, common cause makes the Greek nation, the Scottish nation, and the Kwaka Waka First Nation contemporary allies set against the same institution, the British Museum. This alliance between a nation state, a stateless nation, and a stateless First Nation illustrates the affinities between claim making under the sign of cultural property as a technology of sovereignty at different scales. Claims to cultural property are usually staked in the aftermath of violence, of war, colonial rule, or both. The claims assert sovereign power and they affirm cultural integrity in the face of foreign invasion and foreign rule, globalized markets and foreign science. Cultural property claims thus help to form sovereign subjects, whether they are independent peoples or semi-autonomous social collectives like communities and tribes. Now, distinct from cultural property, cultural heritage is the preferred term in contexts that stress the general safeguarding of artifacts, buildings, sites, and most recently cultural practices. Thus, UNESCO is today best known in many parts of the world for the World Heritage Convention from 1972. Rather than acknowledging the rights of states, the convention recognizes their responsibilities to current and future generation and to humanity as a whole. This distinguishes the World Heritage Convention from previous legal instruments that UNESCO developed in the field of culture in the aftermath of World War II. Up until the 1970s, UNESCO's uh, efforts focused on the legal protection of cultural property. If the primary concerns of UNESCO conventions for protecting cultural property are conflicting claims and the settlement of disputes, then its conventions for safeguarding heritage organized cooperation around the common goal 
of bequeathing to posterity those monuments and expressions that are considered of value to humanity as a whole. One way to put this might be to say that under UNESCO's respective regimes, cultural property belongs to an exclusive us, while cultural heritage belongs to an inclusive us. In other words, while claims staked within both regimes help to constitute collective subjects, the subject of, collective, of cultural property is exclusive, subject to misappropriation, and entitled to restitution. Whereas the subject of cultural heritage tends rather to be inclusive, a collective we that conventions entreat to take responsibility and to stand together to prevent degradation and loss instead of theft by another, as in the case of cultural property. In recent years, intangible heritage exemplifies how, how international conventions, when they are successful, can act as catalysts. The Intangible Heritage Convention from 2003 conceives of the subjects of heritage as, quote, communities and groups, and in some cases, individuals, which it entrusts with identifying and managing their intangible heritage in cooperation with state institutions, NGOs, and experts. In this regard, the Intangible Heritage Convention testifies to an important development in the regime of heritage. Participation has come to play an ever larger role in the discourse and practice of heritage since the 1970s. Starting in the 70s, we observe a turn to participation in widely disparate fields of policy and practice, from urban planning to international development, and from environmental protection to humanitarian aid to cultural heritage. As anthropologist Ellen Hertz has noted, quote, the participatory approach is at the center of a semantic field filled with familiar, if vague, notions. Engagement, ownership, and empowerment are the desired or imagined results of administrative and political processes that range from capacity building and consultation to the use of lay experts in hybrid forums in the formulation and application of policy, unquote. In deferring to an unimpeachable political subject, the community, this turn to participation compels states, in fact, to identify, to label, and to organize these subjects as political partners. In this way, heritage regimes increasingly populate the cultural and political fields with communities, with subjects that it charges with identifying and safeguarding their own heritage. Government can then act on the social field through communities and by means of, among other things, cultural heritage policies. A case in point, the, whoops, cut that one out. The Jamal Alfna marketplace in Marrakesh has long presented a challenge for city authorities, a rogue element in the urban polity. And at very ta various times there have been plans to evacuate the square or to build on it including plans in the 1990s for a shopping mall in a parking lot. Reacting to those plans, intellectuals and activists in Marrakesh enlisted the aid of UNESCO in changing the way that the local bourgeoisie and the local city authorities look at the square, teaching them to take pride in it as their heritage. And as a result of their successful efforts, the cultural space of Jamal Fna was one of the first elements proclaimed in 2001 by UNESCO as the intangible heritage of humanity. That came with a 10 year safeguarding plan that local authorities uh, created along with a special commission to implement it, including a rezoning of the square, the identification and inventorying of traditional knowledge holders and their skills, weekly storytelling sessions, prize competitions and festivals, lots of festivals. To ethnomusicologist Tom Beersley, it is no surprise that the first of the larger more formalized associations of artists on the square was formed a year later in 2002, in part as a way of negotiating collectively for the anticipated benefits coming from the UNESCO designation. A number of smaller associations have since formed on the square dedicated to particular performance genres or particular ethnicity, ethnicities. And most performing artists on the square have membership in at least one of these associations, if not more. And thus, intangible heritage has proven an effective technology of reformation in Jamal Fna, fostering the growing sense that artists have of themselves as being a community. That is to say, a body that is more readily able to act upon and be acted upon by government 
than would a population of ungrouped individuals. In fact, through safeguarding, through cultural heritage, Marrakeshi authorities are finally succeeding where before they always failed in bringing order to Jamal Fna. Now we develop these cases and, and many more in greater detail and nuance, I hope, in the book. But this is our principal argument, that while their boundaries are often blurred and while there are certainly overlaps and overflows between cultural property and cultural heritage, the two represent nonetheless fundamentally different approaches to subject formation. They produce different bodies of expertise and they belong to different rationalities of government in the cultural field. Claims to cultural property, regardless of whether they are recognized or not, help to form sovereign subjects with their own exclusive cultures, nations, peoples, tribes. Conversely, safeguarding cultural heritage cultivates responsible subjects and entangles them in networks of expertise and management. The historical ascendancy of the cultural heritage regime coincides with a shift in political economy from the liberal capitalism of the modern state to neoliberalism with projects of responsabilization, delegation of tasks of governments, government, governance from the state to civil society, and the cultivation of self-governing cap capabilities. Now, various legal scholars contend that cultural heritage has superseded or is superseding cultural property. We beg to differ. In a move that we hope demonstrates the usefulness of interdisciplinary approaches to international law, we propose to complicate such linear teleological narratives by moving from a legal to an historical definition of cultural property and cultural heritage. To wrap up, we submit that cultural property and cultural heritage are distinct if overlapping formations within the cultural field that have developed under distinct historical conditions, one in the aftermath of World War II, the other in the aftermath of decolonization, that have produced separate regimes, the one pre proceeding from the Hague Convention, the other from the World Heritage Convention, and distinct forms of expertise, the one primarily legal, the other primarily curatorial. And they take, different take a different approach to the formation of political or cultural subjects. The one producing sovereign subjects in the mold of the liberal modern states with rights, territories, borders, and property. The other producing subjects entangled in dense networks of neoliberal or post-colonial forms of governance. The one employs return, restitution, and repatriation as a technology of sovereignty. The other employs capacity building, education, collaboration, reciprocity, exchange, and the infusion of expertise as a technology of social reformation. Now, to be sure, particular cases can and do move between the sign of cultural property and the sign of cultural heritage, from rights-based claims and resolutions to ethical claims and solutions. But far from portraying such shifts in terms of linear progress or as an implosion of any meaningful distinction between the two, we argue that there is significant analytical purchase to be gained from their distinction, from an historically grounded and theoretically informed dis dis understanding of the distinction, as well as an understanding of the confluence and traffic between cultural property and cultural heritage. Thank you. Thank you for your provocative remarks. Professor Jonathan Liljeblad, may I invite you to speak now? Thank you, and thanks everyone for um, attending. I'll begin um, just with a statement of positionality just to sort of illustrate uh, in the nature of the title of my talk. So, you know, I'd mentioned inter interdisciplinary uh, cross practice or cross profession and then cross issue. Um, but the reason for that is, uh, and this is a point of minor correction to what Dr. Rentalen had mentioned before, is, um, I arrived in uh, Myanmar in 2014 for field research. And since that time, a lot of my concern has been with uh, the realities of the lived experiences that occur on the ground with people who are attempting to engage with international norms and uh, the issues that arise in those kinds of situations. And what I encountered over the course of the past seven years in Myanmar is that um, a lot of the issues are inseparable. You can't pull them apart. That uh, cultural heritage is tied to land. Um, you know, as a result, it's tied to environmental concerns. Um, but then again, because of the history 
of the location because of the histories of the peoples there, then it's also tied to this question about self-determination. Um, and as a result of that, it's also tied to political issues and legal issues about the nature of rights, the nature of governance. Um, and as a result, uh, everything is integrated with each other. Um, but these kinds of complexities that play out, um, and not just in Myanmar, this is in many developing countries in the world, there's a tendency uh, to, and just to borrow the uh, scientific term, is to quantize problems. You know, the, you know, the more, I guess, colloquial term is to break things down into constituent components. Um, and this is probably a heuristic device that is a national process of um, modern knowledge systems, um, the way that uh, our various disciplines have evolved over the course of the past centuries. Um, and a result in places like Myanmar, what you see or what I've witnessed on the ground is you'll have a situation where um, whatever is happening uh, with a particular community in relation to a particular set of issues will then be uh, separated out uh, into uh, concerns of multiple uh, government ministries at multiple levels, and then also broken out as to separate agendas of different NGOs uh, with different donors. And then in the process of hiring their experts or consultants um, to academics with, from coming from different disciplines, which is all well and good. And it certainly furthers the nature of understanding uh, to have that level of specialization. But uh, what occurs at the very end, however, is that there's never any process of reassembly, that there's never a stage when everything is, uh, comes back together and is reintegrated to deal with the complexities that were there and continue to be there even after all the foreigners have left. And so this uh, is the kind of thing that uh, concerns me. It's the kind of thing that I've uh, devoted more attention to over time. Um, you know, a lot of people have commented my research agenda is saying that it, it seems a little bit frenetic at times, but it's this process of having to take uh, the academic approach of analysis to deal with uh, the realities that are occurring on the ground. And so I guess the theme of, of my talk really is how do we as academics engage with uh, practitioners, either within governments or within donors or within uh, NGOs in a way that is respectful of the experiences that are lived by the peoples that are dealing with the realities uh, in places like Myanmar. Um, so how do we, you know, I guess the question is how do we deal with these kinds of situations? What's, what is the call, uh, so to speak, in terms of moving forward? And on this, uh, I'll refer to some examples, uh, some of which has been published, uh, some of which I chose not to publish just because of the uh, nature of the issues involved, and then some things which are currently ongoing as we speak at this moment. Uh, so one of the publications I have is regarding uh, Pew Ancient Cities, which is one of Myanmar's heritage sites. Uh, it was the first her uh, world heritage site there. And uh, with one of the publications I had, it, it dealt specifically with the activities of one uh, world heritage expert who uh, began operations and engagement back in the 1980s and then continued all the way through to the world heritage application uh, in 2012-2014. And this particular individual, um, I, you know, I won't disclose uh, the identity of this person, but this particular individual had made it a mission uh, to maintain some level of engagement for the purpose of building social capital. And this was despite all of the issues that were occurring with Myanmar throughout the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Having said that, um, the, the, this particular expert was very cognizant of the ongoing discourses at the World Heritage level regarding human rights, regarding um, uh, community uh, participation, regarding concerns about uh, uh, freedom of expression, liberalization, et cetera. And so, the entire focus of these several decades of engagement was to build sufficient social capital to then have the influence at a particular moment in time to then capitalize on the, the social capital to maximize opportunities of transformation, to be able to access decision makers, to be able to pull in resources of the international community to the appropriate parties inside the country. Contrast that with a conversation that I had with someone at Bagan, who was another World Heritage expert, and the particular expert uh, at that location, when I attempted to have a conversation with them about sort of the larger discourses of world heritage, um, had said that uh, law, rule of law, and human rights have no place in world heritage. And I was a little bit taken aback by that statement. 
Um, but this particular individual had said that uh, world heritage and cultural heritage in particular was the domain of architects, uh, archeologists, anthropologists, and therefore had no connection with any other discipline. As a result, there were only specific NGOs that were appropriate uh, for this uh, for world heritage mission. So this is an example of what I think is um, that the larger discourse was lost, that there was a particular individual in contrast to the expert that I had dealt with at uh, Pew Ancient Cities, um, there was a, the, the one at Pew uh, was concerned about the longer term engagement, but then had lost sight of these ulterior uh, um, motives behind the world, Her world heritage movement. And particularly with respect to the discourses that have evolved over the course of the past decades regarding, uh, regarding human rights, uh, democratization, liberalization, et cetera. The third uh, example that I'll mention, and this is something that's ongoing right now, and uh, was unfortunately abbreviated with the uh, coup as of this past uh, February 1st, the studies at Inlay Lake. So this is uh, a, a candidate World Heritage Site. It's been, uh, it was suspended uh, just uh, for the sake of conducting reforms under the instructions of the World Heritage Committee and the comments and advice of various experts. The nature of Inlay Lake is that there's an additional layer of complexity there. Uh, there, it's, it's within Shan State. It's surrounded uh, by communities. Um, adjoining the lake, there are 16 different uh, indigenous uh, peoples. Uh, in the area surrounding the lake, that number expands to more than 30. Each of these indigenous communities have varying degrees of, of claims of sovereignty, um, which have never really been truly resolved. Uh, and they have continued to maintain those claims even under uh, period of democratization in Myanmar that uh, began ostensibly um, in 2010. The uh, outside experts that have come in, in terms of cultural heritage, they've all consistently commented to me when we've had conversations that they were not aware of this layer of complexity within one site. And that if we're having conversations about a potential world heritage application for a place like Inlay Lake, that it creates multiple layers of complexity in terms of having that uh, plurality with that number of indigenous communities having different knowledge systems, different uh, conceptions of decision-making, different understandings of heritage, particularly in relation to world heritage, um, different levels of receptivity to the notion of having outside interference or outside participation or outside involvement and then in addition to that, having different claims as to what they want with respect to not only the lake, Inlay Lake, but also with respect to the Myanmar state, and then further with respect to the larger international community um, within the world heritage system, but also without, outside of it. Particularly in relation to their ongoing issues regarding development, um, and also as well as their attempted uh, levels of agency regarding the nature of self-identity, self-determination um, and self-perceptions about what they think is happening. My take or my suggestions uh, for the larger community is that uh, there needs to be a greater level of recognition and re reflection. We recognize that the nature of the donor system and the, and the nature of the aid system is systemic, it's structural. It operates according to donor preferences. It operates according to donor cycles. It operates according to a very clear system of monitoring and evaluation and a very clear system of uh, expectations uh, about expected uh, desired outputs. However, I do think that it is within our capacities and as, as individual experts, whether academic or practitioners, to have a higher level of reflect, reflexivity, and that's reflexivity with an X. Um, and this is where I start to borrow from um, democratization and development studies scholars in the sense that, uh, that we as individuals uh, are capable of exercising some degree of agency on our own with respect to addressing the nature of myopia. So in other words, that the, the short-term short nature of so many of the aid projects that we participate in, um, and the fact that a lot of these projects and a lot of these donor cycles will end even as the realities that are lived by people continue. Um, and also that we also can address our own parochialism, that we ourselves can be more cognizant of the kinds of issues that the people we engage with are experiencing and the realities that they live on a daily basis. 
And so as a result, uh, in contrast to the expert that I mentioned in Bagan, that it's not simply a matter of uh, containing ourselves within our own particular disciplinary frameworks or within our own particular uh, donor project cycles, but then uh, preferably more like the expert that I mentioned with Pew Ancient Cities, maintain sort of these longer term operations on our own, independent of the donors, and with a higher level of fidelity to a particular set of ethics um, outside of the donor cycles. So I'll uh, conclude my comments there. Uh, you know, some people have asked that I make some kind of a commentary about what's happening in Myanmar now. Um, clearly the situation is very fluid. Uh, situations like Myanmar will challenge uh, anyone, particularly within the World Heritage System, in terms of how do we move forward. There are other situations comparable to Myanmar, um, but I will comment on uh, my statement, will be limited to this uh, at this moment in time, is that uh, in a liberal context, um, I think it is questionable for anyone involved in the World Heritage System to uh, abandon the World Heritage commitments that have been made uh, to human rights, uh, to rule of law. I think that there are ways to uh, engage and sustain those kinds of discourses within the world, in the global World Heritage System at a local level um, without uh, engaging in a political or a legal confrontation. Uh, it is possible to maintain levels of engagement um, that are more, I would say, insidious. I would use the term an insurgency approach, where we recognize that the conversations about heritage conservation um, are linked to ancillary issues. Those ancillary issues are significant. They're consequential. They do matter in terms of sustainability of, of, of a heritage program. As a result, they have to be incorporated within any, any kind of conversation that occurs within a particular uh, domestic context. And so I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I should have mentioned uh, Dr. Liljeblad's edited book, Indigenous Perspectives on Sacred Natural Sites, Culture, Governance, and Conservation, for those who would like to learn more. Let me now invite Dr. Kristen Hasler to speak. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Alison. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, even if it's only virtually uh, this year, hopefully we can all meet uh, in person at the next uh, ASL meeting uh, next year. So I will um, discuss some of the research, some of the work I've done regarding uh, the protection of cultural heritage in conflict. And uh, I think I will echo some of the um, things Valdemar was saying before about cultural property and the Hague Convention. And I, I highlight some uh, of the gaps uh, from uh, the framework that uh, arose out of the research uh, I've done. I will draw uh, from some of the findings, especially from a project I participated in that was led by uh, Geneva Call. Geneva Call is a Geneva-based organization that seeks to engage non-state armed um, groups on the respect of humanitarian norms. And they had a project uh, entitled Culture on the Fire, and they were uh, attempting to engage with armed um, groups on the protection of cultural heritage. I had uh, written on this, and highlighted that some many armed groups actually uh, voluntarily uh, bind themselves to humanitarian norms protecting cultural heritage, and they make those commitments uh, very much voluntarily. So it was a little bit to dispel the misconception arising from all the headlines we've seen on ISIS being intent on destroying heritage. Um, so as part of the project, we. Um, interviewed about 10 armed groups and we contacted even training with one of them. We selected groups that were operating in Iraq, uh, Syria, and Mali. We chose this jurisdiction especially because uh, they were active in conflicts where you also had armed groups that were intent on destroying heritage, in particular ISIS, but also Al Qaeda in the Maghreb and on Sardine. And we wanted to show a little bit the other side of the coin and showing the operations of some of those groups that were trying to seek to protect heritage in those jurisdictions. Uh, we conducted training uh, with the Free Syrian Army on two occasions. 
that was extremely interesting. We uh, noted that the Free Syrian Army, but also all of the groups we engaged with had an interest in learning about the rules protecting heritage in armed conflict, but that they didn't know much about them at all. Um, however, they were very much ready to learn. After the first training that we conducted with the Free Syrian Army, they came back a second time, a year and a half later. They told us that they had taken on board what we had told them about precautionary measures, for example, and that they had attempted to implement those measures on the ground, for example, by um, uh, adding sandbags to certain historic buildings to protect them, or removing troops from a castle to ensure that it wouldn't be turned uh, into a legitimate military objective. So I guess that was one of the key findings of the uh, study, was that it is possible to engage armed groups uh, in cultural heritage, um, and that it may yield to some uh, very interesting result in practice. Of course, we highlighted as well a number of gaps in the legal framework. One of them regards the sharing of information about what constitutes cultural property um, protected under the Hague Convention. Of course, one of the issues is that it does not protect intangible forms of heritage. Valdemar uh, noted the importance of intangible uh, cultural heritage. It's very much focused on tangible heritage. So it may not protect what really matters for people uh, located in the affected uh, conflict zones. Um, so that is, uh, of course, one issue. But in any case, the Hague Convention states that as part of those safeguarding measures that have to be taken by states, they need to make a list, um, uh, an inventory of the cultural heritage that they deem uh, protected under the Hague Convention. That's again, so it's focused on tangible heritage and it may not be representative, again, even just considering tangible heritage, it may not be representative of what some local communities may deem as important. Um, another issue, of course, is that those lists are generally uh, not publicly available, uh, except for the very few items that appear on the register of those objects under special and enhanced protection, those are publicly available, but inventories are generally not publicly available. They end up uh, often being used to establish no strike list for state armed forces so that they know what not to target uh, when conducting hostilities, but armed groups don't have access to those lists. That is, of course, uh, very problematic on the ground, it's very, it may be very difficult in the course of hostilities to assess what is cultural heritage, what is cultural property protected under the Hague Convention, I should rather say. Uh, and a number, uh, actually all of the um, armed groups we engage with told us that they had a lot of questions as to what is actually considered cultural property protected under the Hague Convention. So the fact that they don't have access to this information, of course, it may be because there is a risk of misusing those no strike lists, but nevertheless, uh, it may lead to uh, non intentional destruction uh, of uh, cultural property in armed conflict. And then, even if they identify uh, an object that needs protection, they may not have access to the technical assistance that they may require to protect that heritage. Uh, we highlighted a very unfortunate and striking example that took place in Mali. Uh, during clashes in northern Mali, close to uh, Tessalit, which is very close to the border with Algeria, uh, some members of an armed group called the MNLA, the, movement, uh, the National Movement for the Liberation of Azawad, the region in northern Mali, some members of that group had intercepted three boxes full of ancient manuscripts. So over a thousand of those ancient uh, manuscripts that were supposedly uh, from an institute in Tom Timbuktu. The MNLA um, brought them back to Kidal for safety. In the meantime, they wrote to UNESCO, informing them of a lot of details about this manuscript, asking them for assistance to safeguard them and bring them back to Timbuktu. UNESCO never responded. Uh, in the meantime, um, uh, rebel groups uh, took over Kidal, um, put their hands on those manuscripts, and now it's very likely that they have gone forever. 
Of course, uh, UNESCO may have not responded because it may not have been capable to do so at the time, because perhaps uh, it was too risky because of the conflict, perhaps also because it was uh, unwilling to do so. It's an intergovernmental organization, and it's very tricky to engage with non-state armed groups, even just to provide technical assistance. It may, under the Hague Convention, offer its services to all parties to a conflict, but only states can seek the assistance of UNESCO. Non-state armed groups don't have a clear avenue in case they would like to have that technical assistance to safeguard cultural heritage. So this is something problematic that we highlighted. Of course, um, now the ICRC has since um, signed uh, an MOU with UNESCO, another one last year with the Blue Shield, to increase their capacity with regard to the protection of cultural property in armed conflict. Again, I think it's going to be very much focused on tangible aspects, and there is yet to have a clear avenue for armed groups uh, to go to in case they need that technical assistance they wish to protect uh, heritage in armed conflict. Um, the final point I wanted to make uh, regards the sports conflict situation. I've been recently involved um, in the uh, legislative redraft in reviewing some, some new drafts in post-conflict settings uh, on heritage le legislation. And in post-conflict setting, we often think of the importance of uh, rebuilding um, heritage. We can think of the reconstruction of Mosul, of Timbuktu, but I think there's also a very important opportunity when governments are being restructured, a new constitution are being redrafted to also think of redrafting heritage le legislation and perhaps to decentralize efforts for the protection of cultural heritage in conflict to give more ownership over that protection to local communities, uh, to individuals, also in line with human rights, which now acknowledges the right of individuals, not just to enjoy uh, cultural heritage, but also to participate in its governance. So that was the last point I wanted to make. Um, and I'll hand the floor over back to Alison. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your sharing your fascinating work with us. It's really remarkable. Um, thank you. Uh, now, Professor Jim Nafziger, may I invite you to speak? Well, it may go without saying that uh, whether something tangible or intangible has international status as cultural heritage, uh, not making this uh, distinction that uh, Valdemar has so clearly made between uh, cultural property and cultural heritage, but looking at it more generically. Uh, that uh, Determination uh, depends on authoritative recognition. Uh, the main sources of which are treaties, uh, as in the comprehensive definition of uh, cultural property in the 1970 UNESCO Convention against illegal trafficking, domestic law, as in the uh, statutory designation of national treasures and uh, tribal traditions. Recognition is not always permanent, however. Uh, witness the toppling or official removal of monuments as communist governments disappeared in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe 30 years ago, or more recently in the instance of monuments honoring leaders of the Confederacy and slave owners in the United States. During the European refugee crisis a few years ago, and high on the agenda of the Trump administration, the construction or extension of barriers, uh, principally uh, to migration of people, demonstrated that any recognition as cultural heritage of controversial things, whatever their cultural resonance and durability is problematic. Indeed, far from protecting such barriers as so-called cultural heritage, as some people do, what, if any, is the role of international law in deterring and responding to the construction of them, particularly as the impact on cultural heritage and cultural rights? That is the theme of my brief remarks today. During the past decade, uh, business has been booming in the global industry of constructing barriers on national borders. Uh, of course, uh, such construction 
uh, such barriers are fixtures of human history and indeed of cultural heritage itself. Uh, uh, to name uh, simply the Great Wall of China, Hadrian's Wall and uh, the Maginot Line. Uh, at the end of World War II, however, there were a total of only seven major uh, walls and other artificial barriers, a number that has uh, increased tenfold uh, with the coming and going of the uh, Berlin Wall, incidentally, in the process, such that we have close to 80 um, major um, border barriers. Now, I want to make a distinction uh, between uh, barriers, whether they are called walls or fences or security barriers, uh, from uh, normal screening of people at points of entry and by border patrols, thermal image sensors, spotlights, closed circuit uh, television, and other surveillance devices. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about the kind of barriers that uh, usually expressed in terms of national security uh, are designed to uh, respond to uh, drug trafficking, to terrorist infiltration, and increasingly in recent years to unwanted migrants. Whether they actually do so is much debated. Sometimes it's hard to determine whether public anxiety about porous borders has inspired national security justification of new barriers or the other way around in reverse. In any event, um, how is international law relevant? Skepticism about applying it to artificial border barriers is understandable. Barriers may be ugly, offensive symbolically, or even threatening in themselves. But we have always assumed that sovereign states are free to erect on their territory whatever barriers they may wish for whatever reason. What is becoming clear, however, is that the territorialist axiom of sovereignty is not absolute and international law is gaining traction as a limited constraint on the erection of artificial uh, border barriers, as I'll uh, explain briefly uh, towards the end of my remarks. Uh, the lodestar in the firmament of international legal discourse on the issue of artificial barriers is, of course, the 2004 advisory opinion of the World Court in the Palestinian wall case. There, in response to the United Nations General Assembly uh, question, the court first established its competence to address the issues raised by Israel's construction of a security barrier uh, between it and the occupied territory on the West Bank. The court then held with only a single dissenting vote on all but one ruling that the construction of the wall was contrary to international law that Israel must cease construction and uh, proceed to dismantle the existing wall, that it must repeal or render ineffective all pertinent legislation and regulatory acts, and a number of other considerations that uh, time really doesn't permit me to, uh, uh, to recall. Uh, but the wall is still very much in place, and the advisory opinion offers very little guidance uh, for developing general international law pertaining to artificial barriers. Given the sui generis circumstances uh, of the uh, Palestinian wall uh, for reasons um, uh, fairly unique of national security. Even so, the court did find that the wall violated the Palestinian right of self-determination and impeded freedom of movement most importantly, Palestinian access to work, health, food, and education. In other words, construction of the wall violated not just humanitarian law in a zone of occupation, but also human rights law more generally. And uh, really uh, remarkably concurrent with that decision uh, were two decisions of the Israeli uh, Supreme Court, uh, which, if anything, went beyond the world court uh, opinion in calling into question the, uh, uh, the construction of the wall. 
Since uh, 2004, I think the contours of state responsibility have been gradually embracing human rights as well as environmental effects of artificial barriers. They obviously threaten human rights of refugees and other migrants by deflecting them into dangerous topography. For example, as a report of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights explained, I'll quote, one of the most harmful effects of the physical barriers erected along the US-Mexican border is that they merely steer immigrants in the direction of those border areas where no physical barriers have been erected and where conditions tend to be so extreme as to make the crossing highly dangerous, thereby increasing the death rate among undocumented migrants in particular. Turning to environmental implications of border walls, recent judicial decisions, particularly as I followed them at least in US courts are significant. For example, in a consolidated action brought by environmental organizations in the state of California, a federal court held that California had sufficiently established an injury in fact to secure its standing in the case in order to claim that in the, an extension of the wall on the US-Mexican uh, uh, border as uh, the Trump administration had insisted would potentially harm the international Tijuana estuary and internationally protected endangered species of wildlife. And incidentally, uh, though I'm focused heavily in my examples on the US-Mexican border, I might note at this point that uh, the problem uh, with wildlife uh, is certainly global. And one could cite the example of the 30,000 uh, kilometers of border fencing in the Caucasus in Central Asia uh, that have demonstrably uh, led to uh, split populations of wildlife and uh, deceased animals. Border walls have already caused serious international flooding by allowing debris to accumulate and otherwise to function as dams, as happened in the Twin Cities of Nogales, uh, Arizona in the United States and Nogales, Sonora in Mexico. Uh, to be sure, a 1970 treaty between the US and Mexico prohibits the construction of all works on the extensive floodplain of the Rio Grande and uh, Colorado rivers. Uh, which form much of the border between the two countries without the approval of the Bilateral International Boundary and Water Commission. But just to summarize um, uh, in, the, in the interest of time, uh, the problem has been that uh, the commission has been uh, largely handicapped uh, because of a rule requiring consensus between the uh, two countries uh, in order to reach any decision. So that has not stood in the way of uh, either past or <laughs> uh, ongoing, uh, maybe not so much ongoing right now, but at least during the Trump administration, uh, extension of the walls. Important archeological sites are also in harm's way. Controlled blasting of burial sites on Monument Mountain in the Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument on the border, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, has already occurred, and a range of ancient petroglyphs and rock art uh, is also in jeopardy. An internal report of the United States National Park Service estimated the construction of the wall imperils some 22 archaeological sites that contain ancient ceramic shards, stone tools, and other pre-Columbian artifacts all well preserved because of the hot, dry environment in which humans have dwelt and left things behind for at least 10,500 years. Another cultural impact of border walls, somewhat similar to the plight of Palestinians, has been on members of native tribes directly, not just on their cultural heritage. For example, since construction of the existing wall along the U.S.-Mexican border, many Tohono O'odham tribal members can no longer access sacred sites, visit relatives and community members across the border, worship in traditional churches, or even shop freely. Ideally, 
the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which in any event is uh, not uh, completely hard law, uh, would help tip the appropriate response to tribal interests by ensuring a right of self-determination by tribes and at least procedural uh, protection, such as the assurance of free, prior, and informed consent to all actions affecting their lands. Uh, but this normative uh, framework, available as it is, has not been uh, very effective so far. To conclude then, formal authority at the international level to challenge the erection of artificial border barriers has not moved very far beyond uh, the World Court's human rights pronouncements in the Palestinian wall case, whose facts were in any event unique. But the implications of border wall construction are beginning at least to generate discourse and norms that challenge sovereign autonomy to construct artificial barriers along international borders. When doing so, seriously threatens the environment or human rights. Uh, in terms of the environment, one can think back all the way to the late 1930s and the 1940s to the famous trail smelter uh, decision uh, between the United States and Canada. So that idea has been around for a long time. Um, in any event, um, we're beginning to see engagement uh, of these issues uh, with the international law of state responsibility. Of course, general and genuine national security concerns are significant and must be respected in terms of uh, these barriers and their uh, justification. But walls and other artificial barriers are clearly on the border of international law as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for your brilliant remarks. Thanks to all of the colleagues for their sharing their brilliant research. And we hope very much that this session will encourage members of ASIL to investigate cultural heritage topics using more interdisciplinary approaches. Uh, we can see that more political analysis will be important for understanding some of these uh, social movements to protect cultural heritage. And the scholars who uh, shared their thoughts have published uh, and written reports on these topics, so I refer you to their work. This is a very exciting field. The International Criminal Court recently had a case on cultural heritage, the Almaty case, so we know that cultural heritage is important for the protection of human rights and identities. So thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to speaking to you in the uh, conversation that follows.